Welcome to module one of our course, Post-COVID-19, Low Carbon Transition in Africa. If you have not gone through the introductory recording, please stop. Don't go ahead with this module. You need to go back and listen to that recording that introduces the entire course. Thank you. In this recording, I'm going to focus on module one, Introduction to Global and African Development Agenda Setting and Agendas. Our module uh, will be recorded in the following uh, main topics. I'll start with our module learning outcomes. I'll go to module objectives and topics. I'll focus on development goals and agenda setting. I'll also speak on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, including the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I will look at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's called the UNFCCC. I will also talk on the new urban agenda. I will then focus on Africa Agenda 2063. And of course, I will not be uh, giving you the answers to the module quiz that you are going to be doing when you've read your notes and also listened to this recording. On uh, learning module, learning outcomes, by the end of this module, participants will be able to identify key global and regional development agendas with a bearing on low carbon transition in Africa or low carbon transition globally. Establish global and regional agenda setting with specific reference to low carbon transition. We will also be able to isolate and articulate the low carbon a thread in identified global and regional development agendas will also be able to answer a quiz testing knowledge regarding the material covered. In terms of our obje objectives, we have got uh, two objectives that we've outlined here to provide the background on global and African development agenda agendas and the contestations thereof to provide insights into global and African Union institutional arrangements and global policy agenda settings. And our topics are as follows, understanding global and regional development goal and agenda setting, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, will focus on Habitat 3 and the new urban agenda, Africa Agenda 2063, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Those will be our major topics. Let me move on to one major section, looking at the global and regional development goals and agenda setting. Now, what is going to happen here is, I'll start with a bit of an overview on development goals and agenda setting. Now, since there is a plethora of global and regional development agendas that have been developed over time, I will restrict, or this module will restrict ourselves to those tracking the following, agenda to address sustainable development, agenda to address climate change, and a few other development agendas of critical interest is outlined earlier. Now, development goal and agenda setting involves a lot of stakeholders. Among them, we've got governments, we also have got multi, which uh, mainly involves multilateralism. We've got organized labor, we've got organized business, we've got development agencies, we've got United Nations bodies, and many other key stakeholders that are too many to mention in this recording. Hence, the world setup involves presenting and arguing for the adoption of different proposals from policies that are contesting for a policy position. Therefore, the most important things when negotiating are to place your interest on the agenda follow them up in negotiation rounds and make compromises as appropriate. Now the word underlined there is as appropriate. So there are times when you don't have to compromise. Just take uh, to your point and put it across in a non-violent or non-stubborn manner. And then it can find reson resonance with other uh, uh, negotiators that are on the table. As such, groups that are politically, technologically, and financially powerful 
need constant checking during negotiations. The reason why is because they are politically, technologically, and financially powerful. So then they, have got, they flex their muscles. And if we are not strategic, especially as an African continent, then we can be outpaced and outclassed in negotiating uh, for a certain position. Now, we cannot talk about uh, development goals and agenda setting without touching base on the birth of the concept of sustainable development in, 1997, in 1987. The phrase sustainable development was popularized by the World Commission on Environment and Development in its 1987 report entitled Our Common Future. Now, uh, you would see there that the World Commission is merging two difficult entities, environment and development. Those were the challenges we had then and I want to believe these are the challenges we are still having today. The aim was to find practical ways of addressing environmental and development problems the world was facing. And of course, in our common future, that book published in 1987 is the most cited definition of what sustainable development is. And even today, we go back to that 1987 uh, uh, definition of sustainable development because it is the definition that has shaped where we are going uh, uh, in the future and where we are coming from since 1987. So our common future defines sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of our future generations to meet their own needs. So there is a trade off there that we Today, we must be able to fulfill our needs, but we must also be uh, cognizant of the fact that our future generations should also be able to fulfill their needs from the resources that are available. Hence, we talk of this animal or this creature or this concept called sustainable development. Now, so what we, the, that definition, and uh, 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 wanted us to do was it wanted us to move from a predominantly economic growth model, which actually uh, uh, Chen uh, and others uh, wrote about uh, significantly. And we are saying them in a typical capitalist mode of production, the environment does not matter. So if the environment does not matter, what do we do? We consider it as an externality. You can pollute as much as you want, you can do to it whatever you want, because after all, the environment cannot talk. This was the common understanding then. But as the knowledge increased, we discovered that the environment can speak in other ways. It might not uh, be vocal, uh, it might not pronounce a word, but it can silently speak of the pollution, of the degradation that would be taking place if we do not look and care after it. So there are a number of key players as well when we talk about sustainable development. I'll mention three that are critical. Civil society, businesses, and government. These remain central when I'm talking about sustainable development. Now, what were some of the issues that our common future, that book, uh, uh, considered or addressed? Now, the way I identified in our common future eight key issues that would ensure development was sustainable. So these issues were number one, population and human resources, it is considered in that book. Food security, the urban challenge, energy, industry, species and ecosystems, managing the commons, and of course, conflict and environmental degradation. Now this is quite interesting. When we talk about managing the commons, we speak about the tragedy of the commons. We are saying common property is not usually protected. And among such common property, we have got the atmosphere, we have got the waters, we have got the air. These are common properties that are difficult to take charge of. No one claims the rights of these issues. And as such, it's easy for us to degrade these common properties. And we are saying as responsible global citizens, time, uh, with which these common properties were ignored is gone, it's past. We need to do something and do it urgently. And I see also from our common future, some of the issues that we are still battling with, 
Imagine 1987, now it's almost over 40 years. We are still battling with issues of energy that we identified by our forefathers in the 1987 book, Our Common Future. So really, these are fundamental issues that we identified then that we've been battling with in the past, we are battling with now, and we are moving with these issues to 2050. Now, there was also another uh, development. Uh, this one is called the Rio Earth Summit, or at times we just shorten it as Earth Summit. It took place in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in June 1992. And of course, there was a declaration, the Rio Declaration that came out. There were a number of issues uh, from there. So the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, um, it, it, it uh, defines the rights and responsibilities of nations. And of course, this also set up 27 fundamental principles. I'm not going to go all these principles uh, in this recording. I want to encourage you as a participant to go and read all these 27 principles because they remain fundamental in terms of what we need to do as a world if we're going to be sustainable and even if we're going to address the issue of net zero by 2050. I will just touch on maybe a few of these principles that I thought we need to highlight. This principle number 15, it says in order to protect the environment, the precautionary approach shall be widely applied by states according to their capabilities. So there are two issues there, precautionary approach and capabilities. So as we set our agendas, global agendas, local agendas, continental agendas, the issue of capability will always come into play. And principle number 16, it says national authorities should endeavor to promote the internalization of environmental costs and the use of economic instruments, taking into account the approach that the polluter should bear the cost of pollution. Now, this principle remains fundamental because we consider the African continent in terms of uh, pollution, in terms of harmful greenhouse gas emissions, we don't emit much. And as such, the responsibility to clean up should actually be shifted somewhere else, but does not necessarily mean that we cannot take responsibility as well. So the polluter pays principle remains fundamental when addressing issues of net zero, when addressing issues of environment, uh, post-COVID-19 low carbon transition in Africa. So those are the two fundamental principles that I thought maybe I could just highlight, but as I encouraged you to do, please go and read more on these uh, 27 principles. There was also an interesting document that came out of the Rio summit. This is the Agenda 21. Agenda 21 is simply is a blueprint on how to make development socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable. Actually, those are the three original pillars that we deal with, we deal with when we're dealing with sustainable development. So from Agenda 21, which actually was made 21st century agenda, there were also other matters that were there uh, from Rio uh, Summit. There was also uh, the, the, the forest principles, which was a statement on how to guide the management, conservation, and sustainable development of all types of forest. So then there was also the Convention on Climate Change. It actually emanated or originated from the Rio uh, Summit. Uh, and this uh, Convention on Climate Change, it was aimed at stabilizing greenhouse gases. Uh, we at times uh, collectively refer to greenhouse gases as carbon emissions. So don't be confused when later on somebody talks about carbon emissions, we are still referring to uh, the greenhouse gas emissions as well. There was also the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was requiring countries to adopt ways and means to conserve the variety of living species and ensure that the benefits from using biological diversity are equitably shared. So the issue of equity remain fundamental when we're talking about this. Now, when the Rio Summit, the Agenda 2021, 20, uh, and also our common future um, uh, um, were presented on the table, in, in, in 20 years after Rio, we went back to Rio. 
And when we went back to Rio, uh, there was a gathering there which was called the Rio Plus 20 Summit. Now, the Rio Plus 20 Summit uh, came up with a document that was also interesting. We now call these documents outcomes documents. So the outcome document from Rio Plus 20 was called the future we want. And I, you see, remember in 1987, we had our common future. We're going to be learning about this shortly. We had another outcome document that's dealing with sustainable development. And that was called Transforming Our World 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So I, one thing that I want to emphasize here is the idea of our, we see our in our common future, our, the future we want. Then of course, you also see that even in Africa, Agenda 2063, it also speaks about the Africa we want. So really by the end of the day, it's this connectivity of global agenda and regional continental agenda setting that comes together. Now, from that uh, 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 outcomes document, the future we want, I usually say, you know what? For us to speak about the future we want, it's quite difficult because our wants are too many. Economists will know this. Maybe we should just talk about the future we need, not the future we want. Because the future we want has got many ones. And the future we need is streamlined. And possibly net zero by 2050 is one of the futures we need. From Rio Plus 20, like I was saying, there was also a roadmap that was put in place. Remember, in 2000, we had the Millennium Development Goals that were put on the table. And the Millennium Development Goals basically were aiming at eradicating poverty by um, uh, 2015, that did not happen, of course. And then in Rio Plus 20, 2012, then we had to do something because we are now coming to the end of a phase of the Millennium Development Goals. So the world now started on an agenda to say, what do we do since the Millennium Development Goals are all be coming to an end by 2015? So it means by 2015, we should have another global development agenda that we put on the table. So the timetable was put uh, in place and it involved uh, uh, the UN and other non-state actors. And that roadmap said, we need to have a new development agenda in the next three years by 2015. So that development agenda was then uh, put uh, uh, um, uh, on track so that the world could negotiate towards the new development agenda. Now, the agenda effectively uh, came to be known as the Transforming Our World 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development. But there are issues that I want to highlight here in terms of how that uh, uh, the Millennium Development Goals and also the Sustainable Development Goals from the 23rd Agenda differ or we've got similarities. So what do we, 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 we see there is the Millennium Development Goals where uh, uh, traditional assistance was required. And of course, we, when we talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, there was traditional assistance, but we also need to talk about universal goals. Then uh, in the Millennium Development Goals with limited goals, and of course, uh, SDGs are more comprehensive. The MDGs were actually created from a top-down approach and the SDGs looked at the inclusive goal setting. Then of course, we talk about traditional statistics from the MDGs and under the SDGs, we're talking about traditional and data revolution. We're, we speak here a lot around big data. Uh, by the way, uh, um, my participants, there's nothing like small data. I had one professor in one platform publicly say big data and small data. And you know what, um, I, I almost collapsed. I almost fell off my chair. I said, uh, good morning, professor. There's nothing like small data. By big data, we're simply saying there are other forms of data that now, because of the expanded development agenda, we can put into the system, into our national systems of account, accounting, into also our uh, national statistical offices, they can, for example, talk about, I know Orange is a quite a familiar network provider in Africa. We can talk about Orange, we can talk about uh, also MTN Vodacom. These are some 
of the common um, uh, providers in terms of our network that we know. And once we have uh, the Safaricom, yeah, Safaricom as well, um, I'm just trying to follow those big uh, network providers. So I'm saying they've got the data that they have, which is actually more accurate than some of our state scout offices. So that is part of big data. We can also bring it around um, remote sensing and geographical information systems. There's a lot of data we can generate there. It should come to, uh, to the national systems, accounting and statistics as big data. Municipalities have got data that we can bring into that. Uh, credit stores, uh, credit cards, banks, they've got data. Hospitals, they've got data. So this is the big data we're talking about. Moving forward, uh, in the MDGs, we spoke about quantity education, but now we're talking a lot around quality education in the SDGs. Then, of course, uh, we we're talking about funding, focusing on overseas development aid. And now we're talking about broader funding sources, including domestic mobilization of resources. So from uh, uh, the, um, our, 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 uh, the future we want, there were a number of topics that were uh, discussed there. We discussed the oceans, water, food and nutrition, sustainable development for fighting poverty, sustainable cities and innovation, unemployment, decent work and migration, forest, sustainable energy for all. Now you see these dialogue topics are the ones that ev eventually moved to, to, to our uh, uh, 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So it's quite important that also we spoke about means of implementation in there. So those thematic areas were later um, uh, uh, streamlined into the document that covers our vision. Uh, it talks about renew, renewing political commitment, this global political uh, commitment. Green economy in the context of sustainable development, this was an issue. Uh, and also poverty eradication, it was a big issue. Institutional frameworks for sustainable development that are covered in, the, in that document, the future we want. Framework for action and follow-ups is also covered. And lastly, that document is called means of implementation. Now, when we talk about means of implementation, I think I need to be upfront. We are going to cover this a bit more in the last module, um, module four. But um, what has come out in this global uh, rounds of negotiation, it's clear that when we talk about means of implementation, we should look at financing or finance. We should look at technology. We should look at trade issues. We should look also at capacity building. I think I remember one of the statements in the lead to Rio Plus 20 from the African group of negotiators. They said, if green economy is going to curtail our development, then we are not interested in that green economy. And it was also speaking about if green economy is going to bring about trade barriers or non-tariff barriers, we are also not going to be interested in that green economy. So you can see how these agendas um, are set up on the table. Now, as you are uh, moving towards the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development, there was what we call a United Nations Task Team on post-2015, it was uh, abbreviated UNTT. It was established and it had representatives of over 60 United Nations entities and international organizations uh, that had to coordinate the system and propose a unified vision for the world by 2015. So the United Nations uh, uh, task team uh, uh, was also to support member states and provide analysis and recommendations on monitoring and account accounting accountability as well as global partnership. So what was interesting there is um, there was a report from the uh, UN in 2012, which was now talking about realizing the future we want for all, and also that task team that proposed to keep the format of the, uh, uh, the MDGs. So this is very critical uh, for us as participants to say, as we're negotiating the new global development agenda, the, the, the negotiator agreed to say, we are not going to depart from the architecture or the framework of the MDGs. Now, the framework of the MDGs was like this. They had to be a goal, that goal had to be broken down into targets, and those targets have to be broken down into indicators. So this is what actually you see today, to say when we talk about the SDGs, they exactly follow the MDGs framework, where there's a goal, there's a target, and there are indicators. 
Then, of course, there was also a high-level panel on post-2015 uh, agenda. And that high-level panel, now this is you see how the, the global development agenda setting is taking place. So it just does not come from heaven. We have got actually systems and institutions that are including human beings, individuals, warm bodies being put in place through the UN. So as I've spoken about the UNTT, now I'm talking about there was also a high level panel. And that high level panel for the post 2015 uh, uh, framework included 27 eminent persons that were ad advising the UN Secretary General, I think is one of my, uh, I, I, I don't want to be biased. Of course, one of, I've got two of my most loved UN Secretary Generals. Of course, the late Kofi Annan, and of course, Ban Ki-moon. And the, the reason I'm saying Ban Ki-moon also did, is it's because he did a lot. He has got a lot of documents that he left in place for the world that we're following today. So they also worked with the UN task team. And of course, there was uh, uh, that high level panel had to submit reports uh, to the UN as well. Now, there was also another institution that was created in terms of agenda setting. This was the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals. So now this Open Working Group had 30 seats, as in seats of parliament, that were composed of 70 representatives nominated by member states. So we are almost like uh, uh, they're having an open working group. And this open working group was tasked to develop a proposal for sustainable development goals in coherence with the post 2015 UN development agenda. Then of course, they had to submit that report during the 68th session of the General Assembly that took place uh, uh, in, the, in between uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, September 2013 and September 2014. So just for your interest, there, there were a number of countries that were involved in the uh, uh, open working group. And it's of interest because remember this way now the agendas are being set. So if as a continent you are not represented, we are dead, we are dead, we are dead before <laughs> the agenda is, 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 is set. So I'm happy to, to, to say they are of the 30 states. So we had for from Africa, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, alternating. We had also Ghana, Benin, Kenya, they were part of that. Uh, United Republic of Tanzania was part of that. Congo, Zambia, Zimbabwe, alternating. We also had, um, uh, I think these were the main, those are the, the African countries really that, that, that represented us in this, uh, open working group. I'm not going to go through the entire list. You can always see that in the PowerPoint that we are going to uh, upload as part of your material. Then there were also a number of United Nations uh, Development Group, national consultations, and there were a number of consultations that took place across the world, as per Asia, Africa, Asia and the Pacific, Africa, Latin America and Caribbean, Arab states, Eastern Europe as well. Now, for Africa, uh, the United Nations Development Group had national consultations on the 23rd agenda with Angola, Benin, Burkina Faso, uh, Burundi, uh, Central African Republic, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Gabon, uh, Gambia, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Mali, Ma Malawi, Mauritania, Mauritius, Mozambique, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania. Togo, Uganda, and Zambia. So we would see that also the consultation at national level was quite extensive. So this is what we're talking about the uh, top down rather than the uh, to, to, talking about the bottom up rather than the top down of the MDGs. In this case, the SDGs used that top down approach. So as everything went on, we discovered that now in 2015, then the uh, the 23rd agenda for sustainable development is then put on the table. This concludes our section that was looking at agenda set, setting and what happened in the lead to the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development. As such, we transit into our next section that is looking at the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In your PowerPoint that we uh, have uploaded on, on the platform, on your course platform, there's an activity there that you're supposed to be starting with. And that activity is an overview on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, it's a presentation I made on the uh, at the Pan-African Parliament. It's just 12 minutes that the link is provided. And um, the way you will see all the activities we have put, you know, as Africans, we like soccer. Uh, I know, I think this is one of the 
most popular sport across the continent. So activity, you would find somebody juggling there. Uh, the, the 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 ball with a ball and I think they are playing. So these activities we want to bring that art to say you know you should enjoy them. It's like uh, our our um, our, our favorite uh, sport of soccer. Now, what are the sustainable development goals? The sustainable development goals are people centered and planet sensitive. They are universal, applying to all countries where recognize different realities and capabilities. The goals are not independent from each other. They need to be implemented in an integrated way. So if you're saying the goals are not independent from each other, we're saying they are intertwined, they are coherent, they are indivisible. You cannot then, like when you're talking about SDGs, just talk about one SDG, we are talking about the other, the other SDGs. Then the SDGs are the result of a three-year-long transparent participatory process, as I indicated earlier in the last section, they are inclusive of all stakeholders and uh, they represent people's voices. They also represent an unprecedented agreement around sustainable development priorities uh, from about 193 United Nations members. SDGs have received worldwide support from civil society, business, parliamentarians and other actors. And the decision to launch a process, to develop a set of SDGs was made by the United uh, Nations member states. And uh, as I outlined there in Rio, uh, Rio Plus 20. And the goals and targets will stimulate a, a action over the, the next 15 years. Now we are already, they were supposed to be, uh, this, remember they started in, in, in 2016. So SDGs kicked in one January 2016. Just in case you are asked a question or a quiz, you need to know that the SDGs uh, kicked in one January 2016. And they will actually, that period is going to uh, terminate. Now, terminating the period that might, that's not necessarily terminating the development agenda or the SDG. So the, this co first commitment period of the SDG is ending 2030, 31 December 2030. That 15 years, first 15 years of commitment will be, will be, will be offered. So I said the goals and the targets will stimulate action for, uh, from uh, 1 January 2016 to 31 December 2013. And they are, uh, they are, they are focusing you know, on critical areas of importance. Uh, usually we talk about the five P's, which is people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. Now, there are also about 10 key facts about SDG that I want to leave you with. Uh, number one, the uh, global uh, goals need you. It's not only up to government, people, it's not governments that are to be responsible for SDGs. It's you and I, we should be responsible for the SDG. But it's up to all of us to take action. Every little thing that I can do, that you can do, it's a big impact. We we'll need to learn to appreciate little things that will cumulatively give us bigger things or the make us uh, attain the bigger goals. The global goals will change the way the world does business or have changed. Remember now we are five years into, so we can talk about the global goals having changed the way we are doing business. The global goals are, like I said, all for one and one in all. And the global goals will address climate change. Now, this is an interesting thing. When you read the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development document, the outcomes, the transforming our world, outcome document. It is only sustainable development goal number 13 that is a footnote. Now that footnote reads that to say the United Nations framework on climate change will be wholly responsible for addressing sustainable development goal number 13. So this is why I am saying or highlighting to say the SDGs, they also address climate change because this is a wicked problem it is a grand challenge that everybody needs to, to, to address. The global goals will also eradicate poverty. Like uh, drawing from the MDGs, we are still on the pathway to eradicate poverty, maybe, which is the reason why SDG number one is talking about eradicating poverty. If I were uh, the one drafting the SDGs, I would not have probably put SDG one, no, SDG one because it's an outcome uh, from all the other SDGs, but all the same, it is there in our SDGs. 
the global goals will leave no one behind. I think this is the rallying model. Should you miss a lot of things in this recording, always remember the global goals or the SDGs, they have got a rallying motto or the motto is that leave no one behind. So your daughter, my daughter, your son, your aunt, your uncle, they need to know that they are sustainable development goals. We are not leaving anyone behind. We are not leaving any industry behind. We are not leaving any country behind. We are not leaving any organization behind. They have to be there in the classroom. They have to be there in hospitals. They have to be there in heavy industries. They have to be there in maritime. They have to be there in the skies as we uh, globe trot. SDGs don't leave anybody behind. The global goals are hands on. So this is not a yes, this is not a talk show. The global goals have been designed in a way that you should be hands on. The global goals are global. And the global goals are the people's goals. And lastly, the global goals are the most utmost, ultimate to-do list. So this was a to-do list for 15 years starting 1 January uh, 2016. So if you have not put your to-do list as yet, the global goal has put that to-do list on the table. You might be a journalist. You might be working in the development agencies. You might be an academic. You might be a financier. You might be working for government. Wherever you are coming from, you might be doing your PhD. The global uh, goals they have given us a to-do list. I think this is quite an, uh, an interesting and exciting time whereby we are saying that in as much as we're talking about the 18 Millennial Development Goals, and also talking about the 18 targets. Now I'm talking about 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets plus or minus. So we are saying that we've got a huge agenda that we need to, to look at. And when you look at the structure of the uh, Transforming Our World Outcome document, you discover the first second dealing about the vision, shared principles, commitments, and a call for action to change our world. Then the second second deals with sustainable development goals, the 17 of them and 169 targets. The third second might be looking at follow up and review. And of course, in follow up and review, we use what we call the voluntary national reviews. This is our reporting mechanism to the high level political panel of the United Nations. So annually we report and we report thematically. So the high level political uh, 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 panel, um, uh, forum, high level political forum sets the, the thematic uh, review uh, reviews for the SDGs. Maybe they might focus. On, we are looking at SDG four and five, six and seven next year. And then the countries report progress on this annually to the high level polit political forum of the United Nations. So the voluntary national reviews are a critical um, reporting uh, a platform for the SDGs. So you see in the MD, uh, MDGs, we used to have those uh, annual uh, five-year reports, but in terms of the SDGs, we do it annually based on the themes that the high-level political forum brings on the table. Then lastly, means of implementation and the global partnership. I've already spoken around means of implementation. You should also take time uh, later on to read that outcomes uh, document, Transforming Our World 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, then what are these SDGs? Which ones are they? So what we discover there is in the MDGs, we had those eight um, MDGs. One was looking at uh, end poverty, uh, 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 number two, education, number three, it was focusing on gender, number four, it was looking at, at uh, uh, children, five, uh, maternity, six, it was looking at uh, uh, HIV, environment, was there, and partnership. So what the, the new development agenda or the 12th agenda for sustainable development has done in the SDGs, it has brought those 17 SDGs, which I'm saying we should actually be able to, 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 to put them, almost they should be on our fingertips. So you should not be uh, asked to say, what is SDG 8? And you have to take your time to think, no, no, no. We should actually be in a percent to recite these SDGs, to say SDG 1, is talking about ending poverty. SDG two is talking about ending hunger. SDG three is talking about health. SDG four, quality education. SDG five, 
it's talking about gender. SDG 6 is talking about water and sanitation. SDG 17 is talking about partnerships. SDG uh, 14 is talking about oceans. 15 is talking about biodiversity. SDG 11 is talking about sustainable cities. SDG 8, decent work. SDG 10 is talking about equality. SDG 9, infra infrastructure. All this, these are how they should come to you. you. It's not like you memorize them. They are part of your life. So what I've done uh, as a course uh, director, I have made the SDGs part of my life. So like, even when you wake me from my, my sleeping, I know what SDG you are talking about. What does it cover? SDG 7, what is talking about? Sustainable energy. So all, this, uh, all these things you need to understand so that as we are moving forward, we are moving as a continent. Now, uh, in your PowerPoints, we are going to have an activity that will require you to look at. And this activity, I, I said that you can choose to undertake one or all of these three uh, short mock quizzes with the links provided. And those links are there. You can, uh, uh, I, I would encourage you, they're not, I think they're about four, five, six, seven questions. That you did. The mock quizzes is not the, the quizzes of, at the end of the module. These are quizzes that it's for you to practice. So you know what? Uh, in adult learning, we don't force people to do things. So you can either choose to do the mock quiz or you can choose not to do them. It's up to you. That leads me to the next section, which is uh, dealing with the United Nations Framework Convention uh, on Climate Change and also the agenda to address climate change. Now, I remember I spoke about Rio 92. So the UNFCCC, as we commonly refer to it, is one of the three conventions that was signed during the Rio summit. But there's another one, United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Some of you might have heard of this. I'm not going to be talking about those issues. You can read on your own. My focus currently is on the UNFCCC. So it was now ratified uh, 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 later, uh, in, I think in 1994, uh, the, the UNFCCC, and of course, uh, uh, it came up with what is a critical definition of climate change. So the UNFCCC says climate change is a change of climate that is attributed directly or indirectly to human activities, and that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and that is in addition to natural climate variability observed over comparable time periods. But there's also another body that gives us a commonly used definition, which is what we call the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. I know I'm resident in South Africa now. We also have got another IPCC here, but it's not a UN body. It's the International Pentecostal Church of Christ. So don't uh, confuse the International Pentecostal Church of Christ and the IPCC for the UN. This IPCC I'm talking about has got about 2,500 experts. And these experts, they advise the world on climate change matters. So they too came with their definition of what climate change is. And they said climate change refers to any change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or as a result human activity. So these are uh, the common definitions you would meet. And I think for those that are academic, if we don't cite these definitions, then we, we, we ask which, which, which mass are you from? Because those that deal with climate change, they'll pass through these two definitions. So what is interesting is the IPCC, because the world was debating a lot, is climate change happening or not? This was a big question. They were denialists and they were skeptics, but there were a lot of issues that were taking place and people. So in 2007, the IPCC released a report, what we call the ARA4 report. So the ARA4 report uh, uh, put everything to bed or to rest. So in that report, you will find one nice graph. Yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's one graph in three parts. So it has got a, but the first part, it talks, it, it, it projects what we call global average surface temperatures trends. So it says that it shows us that the trends since we started having data in 1850 to about 2000 thereabouts, they have been showing us that the global average surface temperatures have been rising. 
Then when I'm presenting, I shall want to go to, to the part C of the graph, which shows the northern hemisphere snow color. Uh, I think from about the 1930s, 1940s, where we have got data to about 2000, it shows that the northern hemisphere snow cover has been reducing. So remember, we're talking about warming temperature. Then what happens to the hemisphere snow cover? It must melt. Then this middle graph talks about the global average sea level rise. Then it shows an increasing trend of sea level rise. So this graph, if the temperatures are rising, if the northern hemisphere cover is melting, surely the sea level should also rise. So this science or the scientific basis of arguing for climate change put a lot of things to rest and a global consensus was reached to say, indeed, climate change is happening. And those that are skeptical or denialist, you can continue on the pathway. But for us and our households, we are going to believe that climate change is happening and climate change is here to stay. And I want to again emphasize to you, participants, this is not a time uh, of arguing whether climate change is happening or not. It's a time for us to find solutions in terms of the challenge at hand. Now, from the UNFCCC, we have what we call the two-trick negotiating system. This actually is, uh, it has now changed to three tracks because the third track is the Paris Agreement. So, but to start with, for a long time, remember, uh, we set the climate agenda annually. So since uh, COP1, COP is a COP, which is the conference of parties to the United Nations Framework Convention of on climate change. So since COP1, since all these parties to the UNFCCC have been meeting, the climate change agenda is being set. And now this year in Glasgow, we are going to have a 26th meeting of the conference of parties. This is not a joke. It has been a long road. Imagine people who have been married, they have children, or maybe some uh, children have been born, they went to university and they have married and they are still negotiating climate change. This is how serious this issue is. So the NFCCC opened up the so-called two-track uh, system of climate change negotiation, uh, Kyoto Protocol and the UNFCCC. Now in the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, which only came into force after the ratification by Russia in February 2005, it took so many years, uh, people, to have that uh, protocol in, in, in place. So it identifies uh, what they call the Kyoto greenhouse gases. And it also identifies developed countries that had to take action to reduce on average 5.5% of their greenhouse gas emissions based on the 1980, 1990 baseline. By between 20, 2008 and 2012, so these industrialized nations under the Kyoto Protocol were supposed to reduce their greenhouse gas, average greenhouse gases by 5.5% in the years 2008 to 2012. And these were calculated based on their 1990 levels of emissions. And like I said, they said the, the Kyoto Protocol only came into effect in 2005, February. Now in the Kyoto Protocol, there are three main mechanisms. I may not have time to go through all this. But uh, this also uh, brings me to the notion of what we call the, the scope of emissions. So the greenhouse gas uh, scope uh, of emissions, uh, we have got what we call scope one. These are direct emissions. Now, for scope one, we are saying if somebody was to, I'm working from home, by the way, if somebody was to put a, a cover on top of my house now, whatever greenhouse gas emissions we emit are called scope one emissions. So it could be all these fridges, if I put a generator, the generator ETC, we call this scope one emissions. But there are also scope two emissions, which usually make the bulk of organizations emissions. These are from electricity. So in South Africa, the major culprit, or in your country, is uh, the major culprit for scope two is ESCOM. They, they are power utility ESCOM, but they don't want to take responsibility. 
Uh, then there's also what goes called three emissions, fugitive emissions or from the aircrafts and also travel, all that kind of stuff. These are the fugitive emissions that falls under scope three. You can read more on your own on these scopes. But in the Kyoto Protocol, there were three mechanisms and you should also know that the Kyoto Protocol is a market-based mechanism. So there's one that we call the Clean Development Mechanism, very, very popular. It was popularized, uh, very popular in China, where we are saying a, a party, a, non, a, a Kyoto party could go to a non-Kyoto protocol party. So a company uh, from China, no, no, a company from UK could go to China, a capture or harness methane from a solid waste dump, a convert that methane into energy or for heating or for whatever, calculate how much tons of emission I am, am I foregoing that could have gone into atmosphere, then could be given credit. So that was the clean development mechanism. The unfair part of that clean development mechanism was the, the worst party, which is a non-Kyoto party, a developing country like South Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, uh, uh, Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, Togo, then would be left with what they call a clean environment, or maybe the energy that is there. But then that country will be, it can continue, that company could continue polluting in the EU. But then there was another mechanism which they would call the uh, 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 um, joint emissions. Joint emissions uh, trading mechanism, uh, it, it operated like the Kyoto Protocol, but when this was in between uh, um, uh, um, Eastern European countries, these emerging economies, and the Kyoto Party. And then there was also an emissions trading scheme. Now, this is one that was exclusively for the Kyoto parties. I don't have time to get into details of this. You can read on your own. But what is important is that the Kyoto Protocol, which is actually almost like an extension of the UNFCCC, was there to assist in reducing the greenhouse gases. Now, there's also another interesting concept when I'm talking about the carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. There's what we call uh, the global warming potential. It's a big word, but it's, it's, it's not that difficult. So the global warming potential is uh, in mathematics is what we call a common denominator. So if we're talking about a common denominator uh, fractions, you can't just add them straight. We have to spin them to a common value where they can talk to one another. So the global warming potential is one that helps us to, to equalize all these carbon emissions. Now, for example, carbon dioxide, which is uh, scientifically denoted by CO2, it has got one global warming potential, or it's equivalent to one global warming potential. Then, if, so one ton of carbon dioxide, it's also equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that is the base. So all these uh, greenhouse gases will also convert them to the base of carbon dioxide, carbon equivalents. So when you are reading, you're going to say CO2 with a small e, that is equivalent. So methane, a methane we are saying one ton of, a methane is got a global warming potential of 25, meaning one ton of methane is equivalent to 25 tons of carbon dioxide. So when you want to calculate now what we call the carbon footprint, which is going to end up being one number, we're not going to do that in this course, but you can also read up on that on your own. You will then have to convert methane into the equivalent of carbon. So it will be one ton of methane is going to 25 tons of CO2E. Nitrogen, 298 global warming potential. So one ton of nitrogen oxide is the equivalent of dioxide oxide is equivalent to 298 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Then you can talk about also sulfur, all that kind of stuff. That is the role of the global warming potential. Now, you might ask, what are the sources of the greenhouse gases? We've been talking about greenhouse gases, we've been talking about carbon. Now, uh, there are a number of sources of carbon, uh, uh, carbon or greenhouse gases. And among them, the main source for carbon emissions is energy, energy supply. This is followed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, by industry. And industry is also for, followed by deforestation. Then we've got agriculture, transportation, 
uh, residential and commercial buildings and also waste and wastewater. Now, this is quite interesting because somebody would ask, why are you saying deforestation is a source of uh, carbon or uh, greenhouse gases? Now, we go back to our uh, form one, or I don't know, that's grade, grade eight, or depending on your education system, or even primary, where we learned about this interesting and complex terminology called photosynthesis. Now, in photosynthesis, we're told that for plants to grow, they need to make food. But in making food, they need sunlight, they need water and the nutrients, but there's also something that they require. This is called carbon dioxide. So when they take in carbon dioxide, then these plants, they are performing actually what you call in climate terminology, a sink. A sink is to take in carbon dioxide. So when then you cut the tree, that function of a sink is removed. So then it results in emitting the carbon that the trees should have used. Then it 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 uh, releases it because you've cut the you've cut the carbon, you've cut the tree, or you've deforested. Then the sink that that particular green tree was supposed to be undertaking is no longer there. So this is why we say deforestation is one of the major sources of greenhouse gases. So we discover in the uh, climate jargon and activities, we have also what we call reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, red and red plus. So it's the idea to maintain this forest so that they can continue having their God given or natural function of taking carbon sinks. Let me move on. So again, um, I'm not going to talk much about who is polluting, but what is important is we need to learn as Africans that one of the graphs I, I floated in your PowerPoint is a graph from, uh, uh, I think, 2006 that was done by World um, Resources Institute, Institute and it, 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 um, it reworked the global map in terms of their carbon emissions. And you discover Africa is almost disappearing on the map because we simply are not emitting much. But in terms of the growth trajectory, we are going to now see the emissions pathway growing. There are, of course, a lot of debates to say this net, uh, net zero by 2050 is not also another form of slavery. And we're saying not really. The issue is like we all need to be responsible citizens. Now, when I'm talking about the UNFCCC and climate negotiations, there are a lot of issues that uh, um, relate to, 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 to equity. Now, by equity, I mean, when you read the animal farm, for those that have read the, the, the novel animal farm, you discover that there were other animals that were more equal than others. So even though the United Nations system say, all countries are equal, but we know that in reality, really we're not equal. So the issues of equity will always be there when we discuss, uh, uh, talk about um, uh, uh, climate change issues. Uh, in your, in your, in your, in your PowerPoints that we upload on the system, you can see some of the graphs that I I, I slotted in there. Talk about which countries are emitting more. What is happening if you use per capita emissions? What happens if you use total emissions? All that kind of stuff. You can you can read on on. But I want to move on now to some of the key issues that we use in climate change. So we have got two major key terminologies that we use in climate change. So there are two major terminologies that we use when we're talking about climate change. There's adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation, I've decided to give a simple definition, is learning to live with the changing climate. Mitigation is when we have got activities that are aimed at reducing harmful greenhouse gas emissions or carbon emissions. So here's a good example. If a residential area has to adapt to climate change, uh, uh, especially the extreme of hailstorm, you may need then to move from a tiled roofing to chromo deck. Chromo deck is basically a glorified zinc, zinc roofing. You can do that as an adaptation, adaptation measure. You can also, if we have got a coastal town, you can decide to have um, to erect uh, flood barriers. 
for mitigation, uh, you can decide to move from fossil-based fuels, like you can decide to move from um, uh, coal-fired power station and maybe move to uh, nuclear or move to uh, gas as a, as a substitute uh, of diesel. These are actual mitigation measures. You can also decide to go energy efficient uh, mechanisms, moving from traditional light bulbs to energy efficient light bulbs, LEDs. These are mitigation measures. You can decide to go to renewable energy rather than using coal-fired energy from the grid. You can decide to go wind, you can decide to go solar and add to, the, to green your grid. These are mitigation measures. Then there's also other issues that are cross-cutting like financing, innovation, uh, intellectual property rights, then we've got negotiations, we've got also capacity development and awareness. These are the terminologies that we need to <clears throat> also consider when I'm when I doing that. Now, in terms of negotiations, we know that there are uh, major groups in negotiations, Africa, uh, G77, um, G77 uh, plus China, then we've got uh, the umbrella group, we've got the, uh, the least developed uh, countries, we also have got the EU as a negotiating uh, 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 group, but alliance of small island states, this we need to know because these are now the policy domains I spoke about earlier on when we were there. But here is the, some of the summary of what has been happening uh, up to, 20, uh, to COP 2026. I'm just gonna give you a snippet because we don't have time. So I spoke about 1992 polluter based principle, precautional principle. Then in the UN, UNFCCC, there's also a serious article, it's article three. It's one dealing with equity, common but differentiated responsibility, and also respective capabilities. That always gives us issues. I spoke about the Kyoto Protocol. Then in, in Bali, we see uh, the introduction of the adaptation agenda. So all along, we have been negotiating with a bias toward uh, climate change mitigation. But the adaptation agenda came during COP13 in Bali. Then in 2009, we were expecting actually that we should have the uh, the Paris uh, the, the, the the now Paris Agreement. We were hoping that we should have at the Copenhagen Agreement uh, as a successor to the 20 uh, uh, fifth, uh, to the to the 20, uh, 2012 uh, commitment of the Kyoto Protocol. That did not happen. Rather, I think in the in the Copenhagen we saw the creation of the Green Climate Fund. It was a fast track climate fund by then. There were about 30 billion put on the table, then there were pledges, and we also saw that there was a need for us to raise 100 billion annually by 2020 if we're going to fight climate change uh, effectively. I think in the uh, COP26, this issue is being revisited. And of course, there was the Cancun, we also had the Warsaw, where we had a Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. Then uh, we also, um, uh, if I want to fast track uh, to uh, COP15 uh, with the Paris Agreement and the mainstay of the Paris Agreement or uh, what affects the Paris Agreement are the nationally determined contribution. And the nationally determined contribution, it's countries presenting on the table, say we are going to do ABCD for us to reduce our emissions. But they are also uh, in the Paris Agreement, the adaptation agenda where we used to have national adaptation plans in place. And now in COP26, the big story is about net zero by 2050. We'll see that later on. So uh, just about the COP20, a, a, a quick rundown of what is being expected now in, in COP26, just in case we are asked, so we don't need to be in the, in the dark. So COP26 remains a flagship in global climate governance and agenda setting. And at COP26, we are, we are aiming to achieve four main things, namely, number one, secure global net zero by 2050 and keep 1.5 degrees within reach, 1.5 degrees of warming within reach, adapt, protect communities and natural habitats, mobilize finance, and also work together to deliver together. So these are the main issues that are there uh, uh, on the table for, 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 for Paris. I've given you a bit more in terms of explaining those four main issues that I want to achieve. You can read on your own in the PowerPoint. They are very, very clear in there. Now, I want to just highlight, say, the challenge you've always had is an African continent in climate negotiations is around the numbers. Our numbers are always thin. If I can go back to Copenhagen, you discover that there 
we had um, uh, poor countries uh, maybe sending uh, 10 negotiators, I eat about seven Dominican, I'm not talking about the poor countries, Dominican Republic sending about four. Yet uh, they were uh, uh, in Canada, Canada sent 183 negotiators, Japan 134, USA 194, Brazil at 750 negotiators, China 233. So you can see where our challenge is in terms of negotiations. And those are some of the issues that we can address as we go. I'm now going to move on to a new section on Habitat 3, the new urban agenda. Now, I, I did not go through the new urban agenda to uh, from a planning perspective. I went through the new urban agenda from a, 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 a post-COVID-19 and low carbon transition in Africa or low, low carbon transition perspective. So I had to uh, extrapolate or tease out uh, perspectives that were talking about climate change and how do we move towards this low carbon uh, transition. So uh, I want to be uh, quick to say, the new urban agenda is one of the most refined UN document I've ever come across. Why? It, it had the advantage of being finalized in 2016 after the Paris Agreement after the um, Addis Ababa agenda, and also after the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and after the Sendai framework. So it has actually mainstreamed all these major global agendas into one agenda called the new urban agenda or to address the urban agenda from all those perspectives. And as such, I find it to be one of the most refined uh, UN documents of all time so far. Now, there's an activity there on the European agenda. It's just 1.56 minutes. You can take two minutes to watch that activity. It will explain to you the new European agenda, all that kind of stuff, and you will enjoy it. Now, Habitat, which is actually the, the UN body that uh, addresses uh, the European agenda, like in the UNF, UNFCCC, addresses the climate agenda. Uh, then also we have got uh, other UN bodies addressing other agendas. So Habitat is a UN conference on housing and sustainable urban development. This started in 1976 and it addresses urban and housing issues. Now they've been about, uh, um, uh, uh, con their conferences are convened um, after, uh, uh, after, after every uh, two decades. So Habitat 1 was in Vancouver in 1976 Habitat 2 was in Istanbul, Turkey in 1996. And now we are in Habitat 3, which took place in Ecuador in October. And the outcome document there is called the New Urban Agenda. Now, this is what the New Urban, uh, the Habitat uh, boss uh, said, uh, Joan Kloss, by then when the New Habitat was, uh, the New Urban Agenda was finalized. He says the capacity of urbanization to address the challenges of poverty, inequality, its contribution to addressing climate change and also to advance more sustainable forms of consumption and production in the forthcoming years is massive. No, you see, what is coming there is even citing some of the SDGs, the um, sustainable consumption and, and production is SDG 12, climate change SDG 13, poverty SDG 1, inequality SDG 10. So this is what I was saying earlier. The new urban agenda for me is one of the most refined agendas. And of course, it also addresses the issue of um, uh, cities, which is directly SDG 11. So SDG 11 aims at sustainable cities and communities. And actually the entire new urban agenda is also looking at that. So this is why it is important for us to look then at all these uh, issues. The structure there of the new urban agenda we have a declaration on uh, sustainable cities and human settlements for all. Then on the other M part, we also have the implementation plan. So there's a shared vision. There are principles and commitments. There's a call to action. Then on the implementation plans, there are commitments for sustainable urban development. There are also commitments for effective implementation. And there are also commitments to uh, the recognition of specific uh, situations and realities. Now, the climate change perspectives in new urban agenda are interesting. For example, climate change appears 14 times when I did just like a search there. It appears 14 times in the new urban agenda. And item 13G under the vision proposes the need to adopt and implement disaster risk reduction and management, reduce vulnerability, build resilience, and responsiveness to natural and human-made hazards, and foster mitigation 
I have highlighted in your PowerPoint forced mitigation uh, uh, of an adaptation of climate change because the mitigation part is the one that deals a lot with the low carbon uh, transition. Item 46 in the same new urban agenda under the principle and commitments stipulate that the need to ensure environmental sustainability by promoting clean energy and sustainable use of land and uh, resources in urban development by protecting ecosystems and biodiversity, including adoption, adopting healthy lifestyles in harmony with nature. It also goes on uh, to talk about reducing disaster risk and by mitigate, uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change. Item uh, 63 uh, also speaks around uh, promoting environmental sustainability and resilience, uh, uh, resilient urban development. And of course, it talks about demographic trends and their role in the global economy, which they need to address, with this should address climate change and mitigation and adaptation. So then there are a lot of issues there uh, that has uh, uh, highlighted in the uh, new urban agenda that has to do with the low carbon transition. We will find them again in item 79. And of course, it further commits supporting reducing emissions of greenhouse gases from all relevant uh, sectors. So this is quite an interesting take. And I found uh, this uh, from uh, uh, item uh, 79 uh, very interesting. Process the measures to be undertaken under item 79 of the new urban agenda should be consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement, including holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. So definitely this, the new urban agenda is on point when it comes to um, the post COVID-19 um, uh, low carbon transition uh, globally and in Africa. Then under item 143, you discover I'm almost getting to the end of the new urban agenda. Then there is commitment to support access to different multilateral funds, including the Green Climate Fund. The Green Climate Fund is coming from the Paris Agreement. The Global Environment Facility this is an old but reformed uh, funding mechanism. The Adaptation Fund coming from the UNFCCC and Climate Investment Funds mainly coming from the World Bank and other, other, other organizations. Uh, and to, to this is to secure that um, climate change adaptation and mitigation plans are financed, including policies at both national and sub-national levels. So really it's quite interesting there. Then there's a monetary mechanism that is presented there in the new urban agenda. And you can read this uh, uh, during your own spare time from the PowerPoint and also from the module notes. I will now move on to our uh, last section of this module, which is Africa Agenda 2063. Now, I would always love to talk about Africa Agenda 2063. Uh, it's it is not an agenda without uh, its its value loaded. It 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 it's also contested. But I want to say to uh, uh, the, the 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 powers that were that were at the uh, African Union, thank you for putting uh, the Africa Agenda 2063 on the table. It might not be perfect. It might be contested. But I think where there's no vision, people perish. So as such, this is going to be a vision that is going to take us places because we have put something on the table and never be ashamed of the Africa Agenda 2063. It's a living document. We can correct it. And as such, I still remain a, a resolute in terms of that we need to understand what is put in this agenda. So there is an activity there that will take you about less than four minutes. Uh, you can watch a YouTube video. It's talking about Africa Agenda 2063, I think done from our friends from uh, Nigeria. Now, the Africa Agenda 2063 draws also from our African uh, Union vision, which is Africa, um, an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the international arena. And of course, uh, what is Africa Agenda 2063 then? It's an agenda. Uh, uh, it's a, strategy, a strategic framework for the social economic transformation of the continent over the next, uh, by that time when it was done, it was over the next uh, 50 years. Now we're talking about the remaining years because this agenda 
was uh, supposed to be finalized in 2013. So of course, it was finalized in 2014. So we are, that's actually how the 2063 came into being, just in case you did not know. So the 2063, there is not just something a figure dreamt from, 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 from somewhere. It was a 50-year agenda. So because this agenda was supposed to be finalized in 2013, then 2063 was our 50 year mark and the, some of the details you can you can you can pick there so there's also i've uh, sit in the process that we've followed the issue around 10 year implementation plans the 20 goals 39 priority areas and also other issues but what is important uh, is uh, to say in a nutshell the africa agenda 2063 it has uh, eight aspirations. And I think these aspirations are critical for us. Uh, the first one, it says, we need a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. A lot of climate change is addressed under that aspiration. We also need under two aspirations to an integrated continent, politically connect, united, and based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism and the vision of Africa's renaissance. In Africa, of good governance, democracy, respect for human law, rights, justice, and also rule of law. And we also need a peaceful and secure Africa. Surprise, surprise. We wanted to silence guns by 2020. Unfortunately, we are hearing more, more, more sounds of guns being fired on our continent. It's a pity. In Africa, with a strong cultural identity, common heritage values and ethics, number six, in Africa, where development is people-driven, unleashing the potential of its women and youth and seven in Africa, a strong, united, and influence, uh, influential uh, global player. This is very important. Now, let's talk about two major issues that I spoke, spoke about earlier on climate change and adapt uh, uh, climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation. What is it uh, that the um, um, uh, Africa you know, 60, 2063 is saying about climate change? So item 15 states that while Africa at present contributes, that was then less than 5% of global carbon emissions, I think if it's still now, we bear the brand of the impact of climate change, address the global challenge of climate change by prioritizing adaptation in all our actions. So we can all uh, read um, the, some of the issues that they talk about conditions of financing and what kind of stuff, um, um, small developing islands. But it says we will prioritize adaptation. Now, this is quite interesting because some would say, but this course is talking about low carbon transition. Why is prioritizing adaptation coming? It's important because as that energy infrastructure towards low carbon transition and the cities are being built, if they are not resilient, that energy infrastructure is going to be destroyed over a night in a flash through a, a hell, through hailstorm, through cyclone, or through a tornado, or, in, or through a flood. So there is a direct, in terms of providing a, a renewable energy or a green energy with a resilience. So I think it remains a fact that we still need to uh, uh, prioritize uh, uh, adaptation. Then item 16 also then speaks about mitigation. It says uh, um, uh, Africa will participate in global efforts for climate change mitigation that support and broaden the policy space of sustainable development on the continent. So now the, it's the agenda 2063 is to come back and also speaks to the low carbon transition that I was talking about uh, uh, later on. So really it's interesting to say even our uh, continental um, uh, framework, it speaks about the need for us to ad address mitigation perspectives. Now, this brings us to the end of our recording in terms of module one. I have tried to give you just a quick heads up in terms of what we are covering, what is in your PowerPoints, and also what is covered in your module notes. You can also read further uh, if you are interested in issues that I've raised here. And after this uh, 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 recording and also a reading of your module notes and other extra readings, you are then um, able or you might want, not you might want, you have to attempt to, to, uh, to answer the module quizzes that we have set for you and you uh, may be given uh, chances to answer uh, 10 questions. And uh, for those that are aiming for a certificate of competence, then I think there is a, a, a required pass mark uh, from, from IDEP. I thank you and I hope uh, you found 
uh, this recording useful. Um, I'm sure also I've got methods of feedback. You can also feedback on those channels. Thank you.